Rafferty, it's always a joy for me to be able to share with my church family. So uh, they dug deep into the bench today, and uh, Pastor Mark's here. So I'm going to be able to share God's word with you today. So I encourage you, just open up your hearts, open up your minds. And uh, if you've got your Bible app, this is a great time to pull it out and follow along with me. But before I do, once a year when I preach, I love to share this one particular story. And so let me just put out a disclaimer. It has absolutely nothing to do with my message. But it's pretty fun, all right? So it's pretty funny. So it's okay to have fun in church, all right? Is that all right? So here is the story. It's called Creation of Man. God created Mule and said to him, You will be Mule, working constantly from dawn till dusk, carrying heavy loads on your back. You will eat grass and lack intelligence. You will live 50 years. The Mule said, Lord, to live 50 years like this is too much. Please give me no more than 20. And it was so. Then God created dog. You will guard the house of man. You will be his greatest companion. You will eat his table scraps and live 25 years. The dog replied, Lord, to live 25 years like this is too much. Please only give me 10. And it was so. God created monkey. You are monkey, and you will swing from tree to tree, acting like an idiot. You will be funny, and you shall live 20 years. Lord, the monkey responded, to live 20 years as a clown of the world is too much. Please give me no more than 10. And it was so. Finally, God created man. You are man, the only rational being that walks the earth. You will use your intelligence and have mastery over the creatures of the earth. You will dominate the earth and live 20 years. But man responded and said, God, to live 20 years is not enough. Please give me 30 years that the mule refused, 15 years that the dog refused, and the 10 years that the monkey didn't want. And it was so. So God made man to live 20 years as a man, then marry and live 30 years like a mule, working and carrying heavy loads on his back. Then he is to have children and live 15 years as a dog, guarding his house and eating leftovers. Then in his old age, he is to live 10 years as a monkey, acting like an idiot, amusing his grandchildren. And it was so. <laughs> If you have your Bibles, I invite you to take, uh, take it out and open up to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, starting with verse number 9. Or if you're following along with me on our app, I open that up. Uh, those of you that have heard me preach before, you know I like to use a lot of Scripture verses. So I want to encourage you to, to, to go back with them this week and kind of refresh this, this message. It's a lot easier when we just let God's Word tell it, right? And so uh, this will, I hope, will just continue to feed you during, during this week. Now, if you are wanting to understand uh, any organization and kind of understand what they're all about, what their mission is, who they're going after, who their, their target audience is, you, ha you, you have to go to understand their, their mission statement, their strategy, and their core values. The first thing that you look at is a mission statement. Now, here at Westover Hills, we are all about what? Making new and, oh, we can do much better than that. Making new and, that's it. That is our mission statement. That's what we work towards. We want to believe that people have a making new moment in Christ, but they also have a making great life that God has for them. But in addition to that, you have to look at the strategy and how that is going to happen. But even to take it a little bit further, you really have to look at the core values. If you ever want to understand what a company is going to invest in, how they're going to staff, what they're going to put their finances towards, all you need to do is look at their core values, and that will begin to show you what they're going to put money towards to help accomplish. And one of our core values is the title of my message this morning, entitled, We're Better Together. And that's a core value. That is something that we're going to invest in, we're going to preach about, we're going to teach about, we're going to celebrate it but because we absolutely are convinced that God desires for us to be with one another. We're better together. And my, and my text for this morning is Ecclesiastes 4, starting with verse 9, and here's what it says. Two are better than one because they have good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity on anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, 
If two lie down together, they will keep warm as long as they're married. Now, that's not in Scripture. I just put that in there, okay? (laughs) But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Now, when you read that verse, you're, you're... you're, you're not like, oh, my goodness, Pastor Mark, that is amazing revelation. I have never heard advice like that before. It is pretty simply stated. But how many know that sometimes we just make it a lot more difficult than it needs to be? We do. We make it more difficult than it needs to be. Because sometimes when it comes to trying to develop community or invite people into our lives, we make we are standoffish. Now, I understand that sometimes relationships and life brings trials where we have to learn and have to be healed of certain things. But at the same time, we need to remember that God doesn't want you to journey by yourself. And so this morning, we're going to be talking about we're better together. But before I do, I want to introduce this message in a creative way from a movie that I absolutely love entitled Up. If you've not seen the Disney movie Up, I encourage you, you need to watch it today. You're you're absolutely going to love it. It's a story about a young boy named Carl and a little girl named Ellie that they meet each other as kids and they absolutely just, Carl just absolutely falls in love with this little girl. And they just play together, hang out together. She just talks and talks and talks and Carl listens and he is just mesmerized on everything she says. Well, as time goes on, they, she introduces him her adventure book. And they see their hero there, and they, they know because that hero is somebody they watch on TV and want to go to where he is, which is in Latin America, because they are wanting to go on a journey to Paradise Falls. Well, as time moves on in their dreams, they fall in love. They take that next big step, and they get married. And they're just loving life. Their families are enjoying it. They're just jumping up and down, and they just continue to begin their their whole life together. They go to their house and immediately get to work, and they are just enjoying each other's company. They begin to dream a little. They begin to decorate. All these things are happening. But, you know, life has its way of bringing struggles, preparing for a family, but then you see the next scene where, they just go through a time of loss where they couldn't have kids. I'm sure some of you, that is, that is something that you've, you've had to go through before. It's a very deep hurt. But how do they respond? They, they get a jar and they write on their paradise falls. And every time they walk by, they put their money in there because they're raising money for, to go to paradise falls. But just like life, how many of you had to bro- broke open that, uh, broke, broken open that jar to just fix something. We've all been there, right? Well, the, the flat tire, the, the tree on the roof, all these things begin to happen, and they just keep having to use that money. But it gets to the point where Ellie is at the end of her life, and she has to say goodbye, and she pushes over the book to Carl and says, hey, keep living out the adventure. Don't stop. Carl is just absolutely heartbroken. He's now alone without the love of his life. But he made a promise. You remember when they did the cross your heart? Because he said, what, no matter what happens, let's get to Paradise Falls. So he finds the book. He dusts it off again. And he's reminded of the promise that he, he made to take an adventure, to keep the adventure going. And right then and there, he mustered all, musters up all the, the, the strength he can. And he begins to plan his trip. But then another character is introduced into this story. And this little boy is named Russell. How many remember Russell? Good afternoon. This is him. And he comes in, and you can quickly begin to see that Carl just doesn't want to have anything to do with little Russell. But Russell is determined because he needs Carl. Carl doesn't realize yet that Carl really does need Russell. What is it that Russell is going after? He's going after that last badge. He needs that last badge. And he can't make it without Carl. He can't make it happen. And Carl is someone going to realize that he, he needs Russell. So you know the story. They, they, he creates his house to be a big balloon and flies off to 
Paradise Falls, and he has a little stowaway. Russell was looking for the Skype, and he ends up in his house, and he's hiding, and he shows up and goes with Carl along on this great journey. So if you've seen this movie before, you know they go on a journey. They finally get to Paradise Falls, and you would think that just getting to Paradise Falls is the bulk of the story. You would think that getting the house, Carl's house for his wife, Ellie, to get it to land on the top of that waterfall, that that is the the, the pinnacle moment of the story. It's not. You really have to go to the very end of this story to really completely understand it. Because what was it that, that the little boy needed? Russell. He wanted that badge. And you can tell from watching this, this movie that he is a single, he has a single parent. And what is it that he needed? The badge. How, how could he get it? He had to have Carl. What did Carl never have? He never had a kid. So in the end, he's able to be, almost be like a dad in that last moment. And here is the point of this whole message here. What they couldn't do by themselves, they had to do together. And that is what I want to talk to you about tonight, about community. So come back with me. You can watch the movie later, okay? Watch it on YouTube. But for the next couple of moments, I want to share some thoughts with you about why it is just better together. It's better together. Now, there's an amazing uh, Zambian proverb that says, when you run alone, you run fast. But when you run together, you run far. And that's so true of life because life is not a 50-yard dash. It is not a race. It's a marathon. And you absolutely need people to run with you. The only way you're going to make it to the end of life the way God wants you to is having other people around you, having other people around you and involved in your life so that you can make it. Have you ever noticed geese when they're flying south for the winter? We know this because they fly in a V, right? It's so cool to see them do that. Why do they do this? Because they are basically, they're aerodynamics, just the way God created them. They're flying so that when they fly in a V, they can cut through the wind and and, and not only go further, but they can fly even longer. And I think that's an amazing picture of what life should be like with people along the journey with us. You're going to burn out in life if you go through life without any meaningful or intimate relationships in your life. You absolutely will. God says the key to happiness is not independence. Now, I know our country, our great country, was built on independence. People just saying no and taking that stand. But you have to take it a bit further when it comes to living life. God's key to happiness is not independence, but but interdependence. Because God so desires for you and I, he wired us to go through life in community. Now, Romans chapter 12, verse 5. Now, if if you, again, I I like to use a lot of verses, so just follow along with me. Uh, But in Romans 12, 5, it says this. So it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. In other words, God is saying that community is not optional. It's absolutely not optional. You, are, you may not feel like it. You may feel like I'm very self-sufficient, that I can, I can go on in life by myself. I don't need others. But the truth is you absolutely need to have people in your life to walk with you to encourage you. And I want to share three reasons why we need to have people in our lives. Now, before I do, we all, we all absolutely need to have friends. And there's three types of, well, really four types of friends. The first criteria is they have to be a Spurs fan. If they're not a Spurs fan, they don't even make the list. All right. If that's the only thing you hear today, that's, that's good enough. Okay. Because Jesus is a Spurs fan. Just deal with it. But the other thing we have is we all have Casual friends. A casual friend is going to be someone that you see in the hallway or they work next to you at at the cubicle next to you at work. People that you pass by that are kind of like your hey friends, like, you know, hey, how's it going? But then you're going to take another step and you're all going to have close friends. A close friend is probably someone that you're going to go out to eat. After, you, after I dismiss, and you're going to go have some tacos at Las Palapas. That is, those are your close friends. You're going to see a game together. Those are, are, your, are people that you love to hang out with. But I think there's one more step that we all need to take 
in friendships, and that's to have what I call a covenant friend. Now, Jesus hung around with 12 people, and he was really close to three. So I don't know what that number should be for you, but I think you should at least have, at least in your life, two people that you would consider your covenant friends, people that will stay close to you, that you can call in, call on at the moment's notice when you need them to stand in the gap. Why? Because we're absolutely better together. And so I want to share three things of why we should, uh, why it's safer supportive, and it's smarter to be better together. First of all, it's just plain smarter to go through life with really close friends. It's just plain smarter walking with others other than being by yourself. Proverbs 28, 26, the first part of this verse says this, those who trust in themselves are fools. Now, whenever I read God's word, there's a lot of times that God's word... (laughs) We'll just kind of just throw it in your face, and it just, it just will, will knock you off your, your socks. This is one of those words there. He calls us fools if we are just relying and trusting on ourselves. And I think that's just good, good, plain advice. You see, in other words, if I'm the only one that thinks a certain way or making a decision that everybody else around me thinks is dumb, then I probably am wrong, and I need to listen to them. Because it is just plain smarter to have these people around our lives. In other, there, there's going to be a moment where you're walking in the wrong direction. There's going to be a moment where you're taking a right when you really should be taking a left. And you absolutely need to have someone around you that's going to encourage you. Because it's just plain smarter to have people walking with you in life. What is the antidote to lon- loneliness? It's community. It's community so that you can have smart people walk around you and be there for you in your time of need. Now, we we all grew up with a physical family, right? We all have have our parents and we have our siblings. How many are the the oldest of the family? Raise your hand. All right, there you are. You're always in charge, right? Always responsible, always got blamed. How many are the youngest ones? (laughs) Yeah, that's me right there. I was always mijo, so it was like, good. I just had to point at my sisters, and they got in trouble. How many are the middle child? Where are you guys? Oh, okay. Go to your happy place right now. It's all good. (laughs) I'm hugging you. It's all good. But we all have our physical families. But before long, we... We move away from our physical families. We, we, I don't live with my parents anymore. We move away. I have a sister that lives in, uh, here in San Antonio, but she doesn't live with me. She doesn't live with my parents. I have a sister that lives in Arkansas. She doesn't live with me. She lives there. I mean, we just move apart. But there is another family that get, gets introduced in our lives in the body of Christ, which is our spiritual family. You know, being a part of this church uh, for 17 years uh, one thing that I have discovered and just really come to love is just our, our military families. Because I've been here in San Antonio, I've had the opportunity to meet some incredible people. And, and my heart goes out to all of our military families because I know that sometimes you move into an area and four years later, you guys got to pack up and go. But here's what I've heard time and time again from families that I've, I've met here at church. One of the first things that they look for when they move into a new city is a church. Because they need their spiritual family. They need someone that's going to come around them and kind of be brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and moms and dads to them. That's what, it's talk- that's what I'm talking about. Your church is your spiritual family. That's what, what's going to be with you forever. And God wants you to stay connected to the family. And you've got to do it by being connected to church. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7 says this, Therefore... As you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. You know why the Bible often compares life to a walk? Because it is. Because our walk in this life is a journey. And God does not want you to journey alone. Now, Let's just kind of be real for a second here. I know sometimes we've gone through life in circumstances where it makes it hard to trust others. First of all, no one's perfect. We're just forgiven. But I want to encourage you that you would not allow the mistakes or the past 
to keep you from allowing people to get close to you once again. Does God need to heal some of that? Absolutely. Do you need to make wisdom in choosing your covenant friends? Absolutely. But don't be afraid of that. Allow God to kind of fill that void and, and heal you of those past hurts. But don't give up. We, we absolutely need each other because we are absolutely better together. You're on a journey, and you don't want to uh, journey alone. If you're still with me, say amen. amen. All right. Just like you wouldn't go down a road all by yourself in life, some dark alley, you just wouldn't do that. You wouldn't do that by yourself. You don't want to go in life by yourself all alone. You know, a few years ago, I was speaking at a youth, a youth camp in, in New Mexico, in the southern part of New Mexico, Rio Doso. And it, if you've ever been there, it's, I mean, it's just pitch dark at night. I mean, it's so dark. And if you ever leave a ranch at night, you know you can't just pull up to the gate, right? You got to pull up like 30 feet away from it so you can open that bad boy. And then you got to get out, drive through, and then come back and, and close the gate. I will be honest with you, I was so scared because they had told me that there were bears that were coming down from the mountain, and I just knew the moment I got off my car, they were going to see this Mexican meat walk into the, to the gate, and they were going to start licking their chops, and they were going to eat me. I just knew it. I was going to be a sacrifice for Jesus. I just knew it. And it was in that time where I really could have used somebody to walk with me. I, I could have said, Pastor James, would you please go open that door and, and let the bears chase you and not me? But he wasn't with me, so I just had to do it by myself. Listen, we're going to go through life. We're absolutely going to need people to come with us. It is just plain smarter. Not only is it smarter, but it's also supportive. It's also supportive. Now, let me say something pretty bold here. Every once in a while, we all need, let me make it personal, Every once in a while, I need someone to come alongside and give me a big kick in the butt. And here's my definition of friendship. If this is another thing that you walk away with, walk away with this. My definition of a true friendship is a friendship who's a friend who's willing to put that friendship on the line to tell you when you're doing wrong. That's the definition of a true friendship. Someone who's going to come up to you and say, hey, listen, man, you need to take a time out. Why don't you, why don't you, why don't you sit down and let's talk about this a little bit. You need that type of support in your life. Here's what God's word says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 4. Don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. You need to have someone who is going to do that, who is going to take their interest in you and want to understand why you're making the decision you're making or, or be there to support you, be there to help you think smarter. But you have to have that support. Not only do you need Support, support in your friendships, in being better together. It's also just plain safer. Proverbs 28, 26 says this, those who trust in themselves are fools. Let me read the second part of that verse. But those who walk in wisdom are kept safe, are kept safe. And then Hebrews 10, 23 says this, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to spur, may we may spur on one another toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. You see, God, community is God's answer to loneliness. And I love how it says not giving up meeting together. Listen, if you are only relying on this Sunday morning or a Wednesday night service to get together with the body of Christ, that is not enough. That's why we push for you to be a part of a life group here. Because you absolutely need to be with the body of Christ. Now, your life group may look different than mine. And that's okay. Your life group may be smaller than mine. And that's okay. My life group on Friday nights, a bunch of guys, we get together and we play soccer. Now, we, we may not win a game. We only get outscored. We never lose. We just get outscored. But we come together and we just enjoy our time together. And that is our, our support. Listen, church, we're absolutely better together. I have never seen anything great done for in life on, by someone by themselves. Those stories are very few. In fact, as I start to bring this in for a landing here, let me look at some biblical 
um, examples of people who absolutely needed people to come along with him on this ride. Now, in the book of Daniel, chapter 1, starting with verse 6 and 7. Now, stick with me. I promise I got nine more minutes, and we'll, get, we'll be out of here, and you get to go get some tacos, okay? But in the book of Jan- Daniel, we have the story of King Nebuchadnezzar, and he went to Jerusalem and completely destroyed it. I mean, just completely destroyed it. Not only did he destroy it, but he took all the wealth. He took all the, the, the expensive things, all the jewelry, but he wanted to take it even a deep further. He wanted to take the people of royalty. He wanted to take the people that were of influence, that were, were very smart, that were, uh, just had, had already a position. And it was, I mean, you think about it, it's a very smart, smart move. Because if King Nebuchadnezzar could do that and get the top, top of the top there of Jerusalem, he can have, have them be an influence of the people that he just brought into exile. Exile means captivity. They were on, in exile. They were captive. And here's what it talks about that uh, in Daniel chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. And among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now, let me just pause there for a second. Now, that is their Hebrew names. Now, if you grew up in church, you've probably heard the story of the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace. We call them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That is their Babylonian names. And see, here's what King Nebuchadnezzar did. It says he's a smart guy. He changed everything that had to do with God. He changed their title so that they can have a Babylonian influence. In fact, you look at the name um, uh, Meshach, which means servant of Nebo, which is a Babylonian god. And you look at the way what his name meant, meant in the Hebrew, meant who is what God is. A very clear difference of what these names meant because Nebuchadnezzar was determined to change their title. But how many know that even though those things can happen, people can define you in certain way, but he cannot, no one can change the God that lives inside of you. No one can change your testimony inside of you where God has brought you. Amen? Oh, that deserves an amen right there. Come on. And that is exactly what happened. They were determined to make a stand. And it says here in verse 7, the chief official gave them new names, Daniel named Belshazzar, Hananiah, Shadrach, Mishael, Meshach, and Azariah Abednego. Now, these three guys were about to take the biggest stand of their life. The biggest stand of their life. King Nebuchadnezzar, the story goes, as you read in, in Daniels 1 through 4, they, were, they built a basically this big, big statue. And the, the, the decree was that when you hear the trumpets play, when you hear the trumpets play, you are to bow down and worship the idol. And that time has come, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are standing right there. The trumpets begin to play. The band begins to rock out, and everyone begins to bow except for these three guys. And we find that the story continued in Daniel chapter 3, verse 16. Now listen to how many times we hear the word we and us. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, We do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. He will, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. And the rest of the story goes, they are thrown into the fiery furnace, all three of them, and they look in there, and what do they see? Not just three, but four. And one of, the, uh, one of the guys there responds by saying, one of the fourth one looks like one of the sons of God. They just didn't know. They, well, we know who it was. It was God Jehovah that stood right there, then there with them. Amen? Good. Listen, there's going to be a moment where you're going to go through the fire. You're going to go through the fiery furnace, and you're going to need people to stand in there with you. And trust that God's timing is perfect. You put a clay pot in a fiery furnace and you pull it out too early, it is going to crack or it's going to crumble. If you leave it in too long, it is going to crack. God knows exactly when to pull you out. But listen, you need to make sure you're going in with somebody with you that can encourage you, that can be help you and be supportive in that moment in your life. And what they couldn't do by themselves... They were able to do together. And now to this day, it is an amazing biblical story that we can teach about and be encouraged about. The last one I want to share about being better together 
if you were here Wednesday night, Pastor James actually touched on this a little bit, but I had already kind of, my notes were already done, and I really, I felt like, hey, God is just trying to kind of just over, just really communicate this one particular point. Pastor James used in reference Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and what a powerful moment. You're going to find here that Jesus was still God, but he was going to have to do, a, 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 he was going to have to go through a horrible, horrible death. He was going to go through pain like nobody has ever felt before. Not only that, but he was going to have to carry all the sins of the world on his shoulders. And it's in this verse that you really see the humanity of Jesus come out. And here's what it says. Then Jesus went to his disciples to a pla- uh, with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him and began to be sorrowful in trouble. And he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Did you just hear that? The words of Jesus? My my, uh, soul is overwhelmed with sorrow? He was overwhelmed. He was expressing how he was feeling in that moment. And what did he say? Stay here and keep watch with me. To keep watch with me. Because Jesus knew that he needed these guys to literally be on the watch out. Because he knew that there was going to be some people that were going to come and arrest him. He knew he was going to have to go through a tough moment. In addition to watching, he needed them to pray with him. And here's what I've discovered, that corporate prayer can often prove more powerful and supportive than personal prayer. There are going to be moments in your life where you need to have personal time of prayer, but there's going to be times where you're going to need to surround yourself with people because it's smarter, it's supportive, to pray with you and stand in the gap with you. You have to have that. And that's what Jesus was saying. I need you to pray with me. He needed his close friends to stand with him. It wasn't just something that he thought was a good idea. No, it was a deep, deep need. If Jesus needed his disciples to keep watch with him on the eve of the greatest trial that he was going to have to go through, who do we think we are that we don't need one another in the body of Christ? We absolutely need one another because God never intended for you to journey by yourself. Would you please stand with me this morning? First Peter chapter 3, verse 8. It says this. Finally, finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tender-hearted and courteous. First Thessalonians 5:11. Therefore, cur- encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Listen, we all need each other. We need believers to walk with us, to work with us, to watch with us, to weep with us, to wait with us. We need others to witness with us. We really, 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 really just need community because we're better together. 1 Corinthians 12, 26. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. I think God's word today is very, very clear of what community needs to look like and how it was designed to benefit you and I. So here is the altar call. I want to encourage you that, one, you don't just rely on this service for your time with God's people. That you find a life group. Make a life group. Just underwater basket weaving, it doesn't matter. Just find something and do something. But find a place where you can get connected beyond the four walls of this church. And the other thing I really want to encourage you is to find those covenant friends. Ask God to send you someone that you can really, really lean on. Let me tell you, I, I have covenant friends right now that I need. There's, gonna, there's moments in my life where I really need them to stand in the gap for me. 
Just because you see me on a platform preaching and, and teaching and all that stuff does not mean that we get exempt from life's troubles. Let me tell you, sometimes I feel like pastors, we have a, we have a, a big target on our, on our body than others, but that's just life. But find a covenant friend. Bring them along with you and don't journey, journey alone. Would you bow your heads and let me pray for you. Lord, I just love you today and I thank you for your people. God, it's my prayer that, Lord, as we are dismissed from this place, God, that we would so just keep deep inside of our hearts that you desire for us to, to, to God, to be in community with others. And so, Lord, I pray that you would just begin to bring people, covenant friends, this week, that you would begin to heal hurts of past relationships, that you would begin to let them know, God, that they need that support, that they need that, Lord, that it is just... God, that they need people to, to surround them and to help them in their walk and in their journey. God, we're absolutely better together. And so, Father, I pray that this core value would not just be something that we put on a bumper sticker, but it's something that we would live off, that we would, we would live it out by being in community with one another. So, God, I pray a blessing over your people. As we all go our separate ways, we depart from your house, but not your presence. And it's in Jesus' precious name that I pray. And everyone said, amen, amen. Come on, would you just give the Lord a praise top offering today? Amen. Thank you so much for being with us today. God bless you. Go in the love of Jesus.